level of uh, high school and stuff. I'm Charlie, and I'm with Hawaii Families as Allies. I'm a peer support. Thank you, Charlie. And she and I have been around for a long time, haven't we, dear? Yeah. Yes, <laughs> yes, a long time. <laughs> yeah. Now, we had more people uh, that signed up for our group, but I think they've been lured away. Maybe other people were offering bribes, but we've got a good discussion group, and we're going to accomplish our mission, and I'm going to start sharing my screen. And uh, Josh and Krista, I am um, recording our session, so you don't need to worry about it. And I can advance uh, slides once we get to your section. We very diplomatically divided our presentation into three, uh, given the indicators that we're doing. So let me share for you. And can you folks all see this, this slide? All righty. So, we are looking at uh, graduation rates, dropout rates, and school age LRE, meaning least restrictive environment. And we got that nice introduction from Rick and Helen um, about what we're really trying to do today. We're getting feedback from you folks. And the main kind of feedback, we want you to know the stats. We want you to know where we are. Then we want you to look at how we're targeting improvement and see if you think those targets are accurate and reasonable. And finally, and mostly uh, more importantly is, um, let's see, we've got somebody in our waiting room. Who do we get? Hopefully she's gonna get to join us. Um, we're going to talk about improvement strategies and that's where it, it's very important to try to come up with new ideas because we've been stuck in this, um, area for a while, the one group that's showing improvement steadily is our school age LRE, but I'm sure Krista is going to talk to you about that. And Josh Hoppe is going to, Hoppe is going to talk about dropout, but I'll start with graduation rates. And you will find on all the links that we've given you that we created some infographics to demystify what these indicators are, because if you haven't participated in this process before, it's pretty dense. And we wanted to kind of level the floor of understanding. So these are available uh, in a variety of ways. And if you wanna share them with families, that's a good thing to do to make it uh, more understandable to them. And you'll notice that there are also feedback forms that the MAC branch put together asking for your input. You can do it today or you can go back later. There's actually 17 indicators and we're only discussing 10 today. And this group is only discussing three, but you can go back and put your two cents in about the other indicators as well. So um, we wanted to show you how they figure out what our graduation rate is. And this actually changed in school year 2020 and 21 because we started a new cycle then. You notice that our meeting is called the SPP APR. SPP is the six year plan, the state performance plan, but the APR is that annual report where you show the Office of Special Education Programs how you're doing. You're giving them a status update. And they changed the way to measure graduation in that date in school year 2021. And that's why we are going to sh see shortly a baseline that begins not in that year, but the previous year, because graduation and dropout have lag data, meaning they're looking back one year in order to report. And there is a, uh, a report that has to go into the Office of Special Education Programs called an exit table. And it looks at all the kids that left uh, special education and it divides them into groups. And when we, when we measure graduation and Josh will show you when we get to uh, dropout, they're just looking at some of those groups and then coming up with the rate. So the, the items that we're looking at when we uh, figure out our graduation rate is how many kids graduated with a regular diploma how many 
received a certificate when they exited? How many exited because they reached the maximum age? And, and you all know that's your 22nd birthday in Hawaii. And how many dropped out? And from that, you take the kids that have the high school diploma and divide it by the bigger group. And that's where you come up with your rate. Are there any questions yet? You doing okay? So um, this slide looks pretty benign, but we're, we're gonna do two things here. We're gonna measure our performance and we're also gonna look at the targets because this is the only slide that has our targets in it. So you see, as we mentioned that uh, FFY, that's a confuser, but it just means, I think it's physical, do you know what it is, Josh? FFY. Phys it's something federal, federal fiscal, fiscal year. year. And when they say FFY 20, it means 2021. Uh, and in 2021, we're looking back a year, and that's why we are looking at the graduation rate in 1920. Does that make sense? You have to kind of whoop, go back. And at our baseline that year was 72.24. And that actually wasn't a bad rate. It was just short of what the national average was. Uh, and I'd like you to think back to 1920. What happened this year that may have contributed to a higher graduation rate than you see for the next two years? Does anybody have an idea? COVID. COVID. And what happened in the fourth quarter of School year 1920. Nobody went to um, in-person school. <laughs> they exactly. were all at home. Mm -hmm. That's right. And so, and you folks can all have your, your uh, mic open if you want to, because we want you to jump in. But because we didn't really uh, have an assessment that year, uh, kids graduated fairly well. And then the next year we had the trauma of uh, kids being in school, being out of school, having a delay to the beginning of school. And so we saw a drop. And then the next year, which is uh, for this reporting year that we're doing right now, which is school year 2022, and we're looking back a year, we saw a little bit of improvement. But you see that red line at the top, and that is called your targets. And this process that the federal government and Congress put together is for states to show continuous improvement. So you can't rest on your laurels unless you're 100%. You have to try to strive to do better. And this is a fairly modest target uh, increase of 1% a year, but we did not make that uh, rate and we need to get your feedback on whether or not you think we should adjust the rate or whether we should keep our expectations high what do you what do you folks think Krista and Josh you can hop in too I mean, I would say that graduation is super important. That's the ultimate goal. So I, to me, that looks like reasonable expectations from 70 to 74 looks kind of challenging, but yeah. <laughs> Anybody well, I, oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Charlie. I'm thinking that if we keep our expectations high, then we, sh you know, would be striving more to to try to reach those goals. And with that, there may be improvement. We may not reach that goal, but at least where we will see improvement. I mean, that's my thought. Absolutely. And Heather, do you have an opinion about it? I agree with what Charlene said. I think considering the different factors that contribute to those outcomes, um, at, at least keeping the um, targets high creates opportunity for increased 
uh, improve performance? Well, I, I think we all agree with you folks that um, we need high expectations and we need a little pressure on the system to perform. So here, this is just a slide that's pretty busy, but it's showing all those categories uh, that are uh, part of the exit data categories. And we won't spend a lot of time on that, but that's where we start with our calculations. Here's a, here's a slide that the Mac branch put in to tell us not to look at the Arch data center to get our data. Have any of you been using that? I, I absolutely love it. Um, you, can, you can go on the DOE website and put in A-R-C-H-A-D-H. And the reason that we can't use it for the purposes of the annual performance report is because they're collection, collecting graduation data on a different premise. They're looking at cohorts, which is the way that we used to do it, where you take a freshman year of kids and then you follow them for four years and you see who graduates in that group. And so if you want to compare apples to apples, you can go on Arch and you can compare a, a whole number of different uh, subgroups, not only kids with disabilities, but military kids, uh, kids who are English learners. And it will show you what the standard is, what the scores on the ESPA were for all kids and what they were for SPED kids. So it is helpful, but we're not using it in this example. And as a result, we really can't talk about comparing uh, our graduation rate for kids with disabilities to kids without. And we also can't do a, 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 a just comparison with most states on the mainland because many states uh, have different graduation requirements. They might have three different uh, uh, diplomas that you can get. Hawaii is fairly strict. Everybody has to meet that one criteria of 22 credits and algebra and the whole shebang. So um, we, we are not like every other state and therefore it's hard to compare us to another state. But this data on this slide is strictly from our uh, local data. And I wonder as you look at it, um, if there's, and, and I, I want to just explain that there are actually 14 different eligibility categories in IDEA. We're not looking at developmental delay because that ends at age nine. Uh, and these groups that are on the screen are the ones that are the most populous. We've got a lot of low incidence categories like uh, kids who are deaf and kids who are speech delayed and vision, et cetera. But of the groups that are the largest groups, uh, does anything on this slide um, evoke a, a response? Does anything surprise you about it? I just have a clarifying question. This is graduation rates, meaning traditional high school diploma? Exactly. Mm -hmm. They met that criteria of getting the regular diploma. I, I think, uh, in, anybody have a comment? Emotional disability is pretty low. Exactly. And we expect kids who have intellectual, intellectual disabilities to, have, to struggle with a diploma. Most of them leave with a certificate. Uh, but I was surprised that a lot of kids with autism are doing as well as they are, and we have people like Alicia and Josh to thank for that because they focus on those kids. Um, and that just proves that, that autism is a spectrum and kids have all kinds of abilities on it. So next we're gonna look at graduation rates by race and ethnicity. And again, what, it, what are your reactions to this slide? And just to help you get a perspective, after the ethnicity or the, the group, we put the number of people that were in the group. So you can see for American Indian and Alaska Natives, there are only six that were counted, but half of them uh, did not 
graduate with a diploma. And that's why they have a low graduation rate. Now, I, I always think about the stereotype that Asian kids are super smart and they graduate at the top of their class and yet they uh, are not doing as well as some of the other groups. And also Hawaii Pacific Islander kids are doing better than, um, than some kids, but they are kind of equal uh, with kids who identify with two or more races. Um, these are in, uh, rates that we need to improve though in order to get better scoring on our accountability. We're really not doing well uh, in graduation. Now, at this point, we're gonna move to the topic of dropout rates. And once we've talked about dropout rates, we're gonna look at improvement strategies because a lot of the same ones are used for both of these indicators. So I'm gonna let Josh take over at this point and you just tickle me when you want me to advance the slide, Josh. <laughs> okay, thank you, Susan. I apologize to everybody, I'm a little under the weather so I might be wiping my nose and sniffling or, or coughing a little bit um, through this, but we'll get through it. Um, so indicated to his dropout and I think Susan pretty much did most of the work for me by explaining all of this stuff with, with indicator one, because the rates are calculated pretty much the same. We're just switching out what's, what's in the numerator. So rather than having um, students with disabilities who got a diploma as your numerator, we're switching it to students with disabilities who dropped out of high school. Um, and the rate is calculated the same way and it's lag data. So it's the previous year and all, and all of that's the same. So I won't go any further uh, into the math of it, because that's pretty much it. And we can go to the next slide. Susan. These data, I think, are interesting, right? Remembering what we talked about last time about what happened um, at the end of FFY 2020, in that our rate for 2022, our target was 13%, but we did better than that during the, the pandemic. So I, I, I find, and then there was that pretty drastic upswing right after when kids are coming back on campus. And I think that that's a, you know, we had a pretty huge independent variable drop right there um, that might help explain it. But I was just wondering, like, what about this data? I mean, I guess kind of opening it up for discussions, because I, I find looking at that interesting, like what might be the reasons potentially that dropout was less during the pandemic, but then increased when when kids came back? Well, I wonder yeah, exactly. if uh, for school year 21, 22, if that's really when the push to have kids come back in person to in-person learning um, and there were those parents that, you know, were still kind of nervous with, um, you know, having their kids return back. Um, so I wonder if that's like we're seeing that spike because of the parents who decided to withdraw their their kids um and homeschool them or you know find alternatives but um i i just wonder if maybe that's where that spike between 2021 and 21 22 um is coming from yeah that that would make a lot of sense there's probably a lot of hesitancy to bring kids back to school and if they're getting close to that age and parents like, you know what, forget it. I'm just not going to send you back. Yeah, I would say that um, <clears throat> I think a lot of kids flew under the radar during the time when it was in between in person and online and what's happening. Uh, then coming back that year after it was like, mm, <laughs> I don't know. And then I would say it's pretty safe to assume that that's going to continue to rise. Um, I know many kids were freshmen during that school year 2020. So they came into high school with that kind of way things were happening. Um, and so we are still working with a group of high schoolers that started the school year like that and started really behind and have not been able to be successful in feeling com like confident with being caught up with their class. And I'm seeing kids 
who are telling me that they're leaving school and making a lot of reference to how they started their high school experience with COVID and whatnot and not feeling capable. Yeah, careful not to slam the door. Yeah, I, yeah, that's a really good point too. I think kind of going from a middle schooler to being like a 10th grader, right? Like is a, is a big shift. And I know even in elementary, I've heard from teachers who were like second grade teachers saying like, I, it's like, I have all of these big kindergartners in my room, like that the pandemic impacts were definitely, definitely big. And so, yeah, I, I think that's a good point. Like maybe kids are just kind of flying under the radar because I'm at home, I'm online, you know, this is, I can, I can do this, but now we're back in a school setting with all of those additional stressors and, and challenges. Now, all of a sudden it's a lot more difficult to, to be successful. I think that's a really good, really good point. Okay. Uh, you want to go to the next slides or yeah, is anybody else have any feedback on this? Well, I would just, um, I would just like to have a discussion about the targets um, because, you know, we talked about having high expectations and um, are we, if, if we're facing this kind of a challenge, it seems to me like we need to keep our targets low and just put more effort into it. There's a lot of strategies I don't think Hawaii has really put their teeth into. And some of the data says it starts in elementary school, that you can set kids on a path of dropping out before they even leave fifth or sixth grade. So, uh, you know, I'm I'm a family advocate, so I'm always pushing the system, but I don't want to be unreasonable. What do the rest of you think about that? I think you have a good point there, Susan. Whoops. I um Well, think about it because you can always put your two cents in on the feedback form. Whoops. I, I would agree also to keep standards high. I'm also curious, and I know we're, <laughs> this is for this year, but I'm also curious to see what um, this year's data will show us. Um, because, you know, the first data point is really looking at baseline. Um, and so I'm curious, like, what the trend is going to be after um, this year, too, to see if it's continually increasing or if there's going to be another drop or kind of what that data will look like. Great. I think um, I can keep the targets, but I just um, with keeping in mind those students that, you know, during that COVID year that like started middle school and then have to go to ninth grade or, you know, those are the ones that are the um, biggest affected ones. So I think we're going to see, you know, a lot of the um, I don't think we'll see us hitting because it's only going to go further down, right? 14, 13, 12 and we're at 15 um, in 21, 22, right? So I think the students that were really affected in that COVID year was those middle schoolers, right? So I think after that, we'll see that, you know, uptick, but then the the numbers go down as far as dropout, you know what I'm saying? Because those students in middle school, I think they had it really rough or those sixth graders, they're, they're I think they're the ones that are having the hardest time because they went from sixth to eighth grade, those seventh graders went to ninth grade because of that one year, you know, staying at home. And then like, not all schools are sixth, seven, eighth, right? The middle school is some are intermediate, some are middle. So those that were in seventh grade now are ninth grade starting in high school with, um, you know, all those upperclassmen. So, you know, I think that takes a toll on all of um, this as well. So Josh, would you like to keep moving? Yeah, sure, we can keep going. I, I agree too. Like we should keep the target, but that is a those are all good, really good points. Um, this slide again, this just highlights uh, the numbers that we are looking at um, and where they were across this uh, three year span. Um, so we don't need to get into that too much further, I don't think. And then here, <clears throat> this is by disability category. So 
I mean, clearly something stands out. I don't know if you, uh, this would be a good time to open it up again to discussion about maybe um, what your all thoughts are on this. This also corresponds, right, with what we were talking about with diplomas um, previously. They definitely seem connected. Um, I think it just kind of, this data really points out that the pandemic really put a spotlight on mental health um, and the impact that it had on our students' mental health. And I think that can be kind of a, be seen in this graph um, by, you know, students with emotional uh, disabilities that had the highest, and I would, you know, dare to say drastically higher increase uh, or percentage than all other eligibility categories um, of dropout. Um, and, you know, you have to wonder why. Yeah, I think the two things that stand out is one, what Alicia had mentioned, but also the second is SLD. I think that one is really hard for me to comprehend because of the fact that we know that those students have average cognition. So if we're doing what we can within our classrooms to give students access to learning, um, our hope would that they would be included both academically and, and socially within the school, which would make them want to stay and not uh, drop out. So that one was a little bit surprising. Yeah. Any other thoughts on, on uh these numbers, these percentages. Hi, Josh. I just wanted to also quickly, sorry to interrupt, say nope. in response to Alicia's comment, um, I also think that for the COVID uh, time when kids are not in schools, um, their access to intervention and supports was, you know, so drastically reduced. And um, yes, their own and their family needs increase around emotional health. And then the uh, you know decrease of available support, so it's just not a surprising outcome to me. Yeah, it's kind of like the perfect storm to really yeah. stress stress kids out, and yeah. and you know on the flip side, stress out teachers and systems, right? Everybody yeah. was sort of stressed, <laughs> and then those who are the most vulnerable are gonna, yeah. you know, have the hardest time, and and that's where we. It's good that we have this data to spotlight that that's a big concern. Thank you. Good, good, yeah. good feedback. Thank you. That that's what I had noticed also what um she was talking about the emotional. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, and then here, oh yeah, the the previous one was was just by by uh right. population. Sorry. Yeah. And I know I I you can see though by the sample size. So like again. Um, you know, American Indian, Alaska Native, they're 0.4%. Point, point I identify as um, two or more on the census, but I went back and looked at the census and that's like 0.4%. So there's some sample size, you know, discrepancies that could skew that, but otherwise, yeah, we, you can see the dropout rates are sort of um, mixed, a mixed bag. Um, I'm not sure if you know, you guys have some discussion around that, about so why I that think, might be. I think Asian is sort of a um, category that is, you know, it's not specific enough in terms of groups. I agree. I even think that about Hawaiian and Pacific Islander, knowing how many Pacific Islander uh, migrants we get and how different their needs are from like the native Hawaiian population. Because, you know, I live out in Nanakuli, Waianae, and those are definitely two different groups with different, you know, issues and histories. So, yeah, I, I know, I, I feel like this race ethnicity thing, you take it with a grain of salt because there's not really, we're not so heterogeneous, you know, it, or the way it, it doesn't necessarily fall along these lines, but it's interesting to look at nonetheless, but yeah. I don't, I don't know if, I just have a wondering and I don't know if it's, you know, relevant for this discussion, but just looking at the numbers in the parentheses, um, like, I also wonder why the Hawaiian Pacific Islander numbers are so high compared to all the other um, 
race and ethnicities in terms of the number of children with disabilities that have ex exited special education. Um, I was just, you know, kind of wondering why that might be. Um, not just focusing on the percentages, but actually looking at like the um, number of students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The proportionality of representation in special education period, yeah. And I think that's a, a good question that isn't captured in this data. That's a very good point to make. Um, it's very cool. Yeah, I was gonna say that speaks to the bigger, right? The disproportionality of it, yeah, for sure. Yeah, great point. Um, okay, we can probably move on to strategies for improvement. I'm gonna, I feel like Susan is a rock star in, in going over all this. <laughs> I don't know about that. Um, we'll just, now we've got an expert in the room and uh, Sarah, Sarah, they have listed you as the third bullet of how you're keeping kids graduating and in and and not dropping out. How, would you like to speak to that a little bit? How we're keeping them from preventing them from dropping out? They're, they're saying you're a major strategy for improvement is is having your service available to kids. And could you get into that a little bit? Um, yeah, so I mean, like, as far as what we're seeing with our kids as it uh, relates to dropping out is oftentimes our kids are moving around so much and they get lost in the shuffle. And so, for example, we've had, well, I don't know. I don't know if I should give examples right now. But anyways, what we see a lot is that the kids, like I said, they get lost in the shuffle. They're moving from place to place and schools are having difficulty time scheduling meetings or the attendance are problems. And so finding those kids and helping them to get re-engaged with their team is super important. Um, unfortunately, what happens is sometimes they get so far behind in their credit accrual that it's difficult to get caught back up once they've had so many moves. But I, I wanna I wanna give Sarah a lot of credit because she spent a lot of time on Maui uh, this this semester and um, they've really stepped in to help families who've been displaced and, and don't have stable living uh, situations. But that's true all over the state and uh, it's a very very essential program. Um, in some cases, it's a band aid, right, uh, Sarah? But at least you're there to help direct them toward other resources. Uh, some of the innovative things that have happened in the last couple of years are uh, that we've really put an emphasis on social emotional learning. I don't know how many of you have used that dashboard and whether or not you think that program is helpful. I've seen it presented and it looks glossy and helpful, but uh, I don't know how, how well it gets down to the individual student. But there are also uh, a number of resources around mental health. So that Here to Help is the department's um, new direction that they're going in into. I mean, they've always had school-based behavioral health for years and years, but they are now adopting uh, some protocols that were developed in the mental health arena uh, and it's all around evidence-based care. So you can provide emotional support to a kiddo, but if you don't target it to meet their specific needs, you don't get a lot of uh, result. So uh, we can be proud of the department that they are really doing a lot of training and getting very specific about what works for whom. Uh, and they've also hired Hazel Health. Have any of you had any encounters with them? So they are, oh, good. Uh, did you want to say anything about it, Sarah? Uh, no, not especially, just that we are eligible, not eligible, qualified, trained, we're trained to make referrals to Hazel Health. And, and they are a combination of both local and mainland mental health professionals. Now we've gotten feedback in SEAC that the, the mainland mental health professionals sometimes don't fit because they don't understand Hawaii culture that well. Uh, but they are 
able to give kids at least six sessions and then try to make a bridge to get them uh, referred to other sources of mental health support. So that's a good thing. Now, I skipped over number one, which is, th these are the heavy hitters, uh, Hawaii multi-tiered uh, system of supports where you are you are in every classroom and you are paying attention to how well kids are performing, not only academically, but uh, emotionally, if they have any physical needs and if they have behavioral needs. And you are trying to get them uh, support early rather than waiting for them to fail in any one area. So even special ed kids uh, can receive HMTSS supports if it's in an area where they don't have an IEP goal because it's advancing uh, their their capacity and capability to keep in school and do well. We've got some more on the next page. Any questions about these, this group? So the next, we will also, there they're spelling out in HMTSS specifically. Um, another fairly new uh, innovation is career pathways. Now we've had CTE, which is career and technical education for a while, but we've seen high schools do a much better job of actually creating career pathways for students. And that can be a, a real hook for kids who are not doing well in other areas if they have a, a, a vocation that they're doing well, uh, performing well, and they can learn in that venue, then it really does help keep kids interested and, and motivated. Um, the LDS is more for the educators or the administrators use. It tells them when kids are at risk of graduation, uh, problems or dropping out because it looks at attendance. You know, attendance is one of the the big hallmarks of whether kids uh, drop out or not uh, or get good grades and, and manage to get the 22 credits. It also looks at uh, behavioral uh, referrals and academic uh, data. So it's, it's a way to really pay attention to what the kids are doing and try to get them help early. And often they that last bullet, um, personalized interventions. There's a lot of national data that says that the one thing that keeps kids in school is a, an adult uh, who really shows that they care about them, that there are um, a, a lot of, uh, what do I want to say, if, if testimonials from students saying, if it weren't for Mrs. So-and-so, or if it weren't for Coach So-and-so, I would have dropped out of school or I wouldn't have stuck around. So that, some, that personal connection, not only from your peers, but from adults who appear to care for you, that, that makes a big, big difference for kids. And uh, when I was pointing out our uh, infographics, you know, spin comes from a very family point of view. And we we thought one of the major strategies for improvement is family engagement. And we prefer to call it a family school partnership because partnership connotes uh, equal status, uh, sharing responsibility. And if families aren't really involved in their kids' education, and there's a lot of reasons why they can't be, but when they are involved, uh, they can really help kids stabilize and stay in school. So that's really important. And teachers need to honor families, respect families for their input and provide them with supports for that to work. Um, another strategy I would suggest would be to tone down the suspensions. Uh, it's hard to get principals to adopt that stance because we tried several years ago with the Board of Education to cap uh, suspensions or to actually uh, avoid them altogether for kids in elementary school, but we couldn't get it through because that's something principals like to have as a backup when they think kids are not um, following rules or might be a risk to, to themselves or others. But there are many states that have adopted better strategies around 
positive behavioral supports and don't suspend as many students as we do. So that's my two cents. What what do you folks think would also be a good strategy for either graduation or um, uh, or um, dropout or both? And then we need to move on and give Krista a few minutes to her do her thing. Does anybody else have any ideas? Well, Susan, I agree with you about the um, suspension things. I mean, sometimes it seems to be that it's so easy for them to just say he's suspended he or she's suspended. I mean, to where you have all these suspensions going on and, you know, I it, it doesn't help the youth and it doesn't you know, I mean, they can't progress if they're sitting at home. Um, and I just think that there has to be other other things that they could put in place rather than suspending all the time. So I'm in agreement with that. Thank you. Yeah, I think a lot of schools, um, I wouldn't say a lot, but some schools now are it's gaining more traction to have more restorative practices instead of, right, in in suspending them either in school or out of school because to your point Charlie right like they're not getting much out of school but even if there's in school suspension they're not getting the same things that they need and that the rest of their peers are getting um, so I'm hoping as those restorative practices and that kind of approach positive behavior approach is getting some traction it will gain some more and it can impact this in a positive way but I think that's something that as a state it would be nice if we can bolster up in all of our campuses because right now I just see more a majority of that happening in our elementary campuses. That's so I can speak to that a little bit as well. Um, I do know that our current assistant superintendent Annie Kalama um, this is one of her really um, high priority areas is looking at alternatives to suspension and restorative practices across the state um, and really um, looking at, in addition to just um, alternatives to suspension, looking at also any sort of disproportionality um, or disparity in suspension data across ethnicities, across um, vulnerable populations, including students with disabilities, things like that, and really trying to drill down to the root cause of why that might be happening. Um, so I do know that that is something that is high on the priority list in terms of looking at that. And, you know, like Krista said, that's, that's really looking at preventative measures before we even get to a place of there needing, you know, there being an incident that has occurred, what, um, you know, systems of support are being put in place at lower um, tiers um, and, you know, basically what is embedded within even that school culture and that school, school-wide set of expectations that are happening. Um, so, yeah. Uh, I, I, I just add that um, there, there is an important um, indicator uh, on our APR. It's number four. It's about suspensions and expulsions. And for years and years, I would always sit on that committee and raise cane because our rates have been too much. The, the problem with it uh, in the APR, and you folks touched on this a minute ago where we were talking about reporting on ethnicities, but it's not drilled down to Hawaii's uh, unique composition of kids. You know, we, we've got to get down into specific categories in order to see where we need to put our energy. And the same goes with OSEP when they collect suspension data. They only want to know who suspended kids for 10 or more days in the school year. What well, anybody uh, in the field that looks at suspension can tell you a suspension of one day or two days can really change a kid's course. So we actually were seeing a lot of suspensions less than 10 days. And our SEAC report always highlights that because kids with disabilities are suspended at least twice as much as kids without disabilities. So it's something to think about, but I've already blabbed too long. Now, the good news is that we don't have to leave until uh, 
1050. So we still have a half an hour for you, Krista. Are you folks wanting to put in some more ideas or do you want to move on to Krista's presentation? I just want to add one thing. Um, I totally agree with the restorative practices and everything that was just shared. And one other thing that I might add as far as other strategies or areas for improvement when it comes to dropout and graduation rate uh, could be improved collaboration across the different school teams. Um, there's a lot of um, overlap in different areas that exist with students with disabilities, whether like was mentioned that they could be migrant, they could be EL, they could be experiencing homelessness. And there might be different areas that each of us are working in individually. Um, but if there's a way to improve that collaboration and come together um, to all ultimately work towards the same goal as a team to reach that successful graduation or prevent dropout. <clears throat> That's really a and great idea. Yeah. I just wanted to kind of make a comment too, and it, I think, is similar to Sarah's sentiments, but also, um, you know, the a, a lot of the strategies that were shared, um, those are gen ed strategies, like for all students. Um, and I mean, we all know our, our SPED students are gen ed students first, right? But I want to just make sure that through all of those frameworks, all of those um, strategies that our students, especially those with more complex needs, are being addressed um, and called out specifically because sometimes I just, you know, in the past have seen that maybe it's not representative of all students. So I think just making sure that when we talk about MTSS, when we talk about all of these big overarching strategies that we are addressing you know, all of, more of our vulnerable populations specifically in there as well. Well, and I I don't want to put you on the spot, Heather, but you are our expert when it comes to kids getting up to the the university level. Um, what what vulnerabilities are you seeing when when the kids get to you, and what do you think the DOE could have done better? Oh, that's a big question, Suze. <laughs> Oh, um, big question. Yeah. I think what, uh, you know, kind of, I think when graduates get to um, even an associate's level community of learning, you know, one of our community colleges, even uh, let alone UH, um, if they have been a student with any kind of disability in the past, the transition to university level all of those disability, all that disability documentation um, can travel with them and they can have um, once they, if they have a current evaluation and one problem we have in our state is that uh, eligibility determination and reevaluation process is not as consistent as it might need to be. So folks are not showing up at the university level with updated evaluations so that they can get accommodations even at the university level. Um, so they have to go through a new re-eval process. So that's one thing like looking back that uh, or, you know, looking at the trajectory of their preparation for transition that I feel like we'd love to see more departments and more schools provide updated evaluations for learners preparing to go to community college or college. Uh, it falls on advocacy of parents and that can um you just, you know, so success rates are reliant then on parent ability to advocate. Um, but one thing I was going to say, and I know you're waiting to move on, but um, I've also, I, we're talking, you know, a lot of preventative, but I think where I've seen schools be successful with keeping kids um, in school in preparation to graduate as where they're able um, and yet uh, I've seen schools to, you know, develop sort of alternative settings within a high school and all different kinds of um, approaches there, kids with disabilities, kids with EBD as a primary. Um, and I think that's something that takes money and staffing and planning, but it is um, a very successful way that I've seen some mainland schools also be successful with um, retention and getting more kids to graduation, you know, and reducing suspension and expulsion. That's really helpful. Long answer. Sorry. 
So Marlene, did you want to put any two cents in or you want to keep moving? I'm good. Thank you. Okay. But those, those are wonderful ideas and uh, they're going to be very helpful to the MAC branch and the exceptional support branch as we move forward. So here we're going to get into least restrictive environment. And we found the perfect person to present because she's as enthusiastic as almost anybody I know, except maybe myself about the topic. <laughs> I am. I was saying I live, breathe, eat, sleep, <laughs> the inclusive environment, inclusive practices. So and I understood and I was very aware that everyone joining this group, the main focus was high school. So I was okay just waiting and, and adapting. So I said, if we want to spend a lot more time with that, I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, but indicator five is our school-aged LRE indicator. Um, and there are three parts to that indicator that we're looking at, which is um, A, is the percentage of students within the gen ed setting for 80% more of the day. Um, B is inside the regular or the gen ed class within less than 40% of the day. And the last one is the separate schools, residential facilities, homebound and hospital placement. So those are the three parts uh, to indicator five. So the way that they measure is pretty, I think, simple. And the fact that they look at the percentage of children with that um, indicator on their IEP, whether it's inside the gen ed class for 80% or more of the day or less than 40 or a separate setting. And they divide that um, from the total number of students and then they multiply that by 100. So that's how we get our percentages. So this is for the first part, indicator 5A, and this is really where I do the bulk of my um, efforts of looking at our students receiving special education services within that jet ed setting for 80% or more of the school day. And you're always going to hear me say students receiving special education services because I don't, I like to remove the label of SPED students because like Alicia said, these are all of our students that we're jointly responsible for. They just receive special education services. So for indicator 5A. Um, the baseline and the target was set in 2020, um, and that was 50.71%. I want to just give you guys some like quick historical data is in 2017, we're at 37%, which was drastically lower than this baseline data in 2020. Um, so we did make quite some gains there. Um, um, and the reason why I'm giving you that information is because we made such great gains in a, a couple years span um, that you see the next target was 53%. And then the one after that was 55%. Um, so in 2021, unfortunately, we did not meet that 53% target. We're at 52.54%. And then in 2022, um, 52.77%. Again, we did not meet that target, but to Susan's point, um, this is an indicator where we have seen progress in, it's just unfortunately um, not to the rates that we would like it to um, progress. So you see at the bottom, there's additional baseline or additional targets. So the next one is 57% and it's going to increase like that by 2% every year. So, um, I think just like with the other indicators Susan and Josh presented, we can have a discussion about um, whether or not we think these are great targets to keep, raise, lower expectations, keep expectations high. Um, because like I said, historically we have had an upswing, but we haven't had that great gain like we did um, from 2017 to 2020. So thoughts on the target that 2% gain every year. I have exceptional wait time. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I would say to keep it the same. I think this has a correlation as well to, you know, the COVID situation and all that, and in time it'll get better. So I think just leave it. I would say to leave it the way it is. Any other thoughts? Heather, I see you unmuted. Oh, yeah, I had okay. a question. Um, 
I just, I live on Maui. And so I just know that, um, uh, training around improving inclusion rates, um, for some of our district happened just before COVID a lot of intensive training and, um, Stetson was brought in to do uh, district training. And so I know that that contributes to an increase in those rates. You know, I'm always curious because I, uh, prior to working at the university, I was, uh, teacher of students with mild to moderate disabilities for 25 years. And so I always want to know about learning outcomes as we understand, you know, these, these momentums. For sure. Yeah. I mean, we do have data both within the state, but then also there's evidence, um, throughout the U S that it, positively impacts um, learning outcomes for students to be included within that gen ed setting for a number of reasons, right? They get that academic language, the vocabulary, those peer models, but also typically the expectations are higher within the gen ed setting rather than a remedial approach that often happens when students are pulled out, right? So when we keep that remedial approach, we're lowering our expectations, which can sometimes create our own natural achievement gap for students with disabilities especially for those students um, that we've talked about that have average cognition um, where they should be able to uh, achieve just like their non-disabled peers. So thinking about they have average cognition if we are giving them more remedial approach then sometimes we're creating our own achievement gap. Um, so to your point in the very beginning where you mentioned Stetson came in before the pandemic, yes. And we'll talk about that like a little bit deeper when we talk about the things that we've done. Okay. But for sure, I think that that is part of a factor here in the growth um, and the fact that maybe it's not as great of gains that we had before was a lot of schools did have momentum going into the pandemic in regards to placement decisions for students and really that general understanding that these are all of our students. Um, so I think when the pandemic hit, some of our schools kind of regressed back to the things that they were either comfortable with doing before or maybe they had to put the brakes on some of the training and the learning because it was a very overwhelming situation for everyone yeah and I, I I'm I'm in my position and have been for 40 years because of my son Jason who is a, an adult with a significant disability and he was one of the very first kids to be included back in 1991, and it changed my whole perspective. My hero at the time was a man named Norman Kuntz, who pulled out Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And anybody that took sociology knows that you have to have your basic needs met, and Sarah knows this well, before you can you know, move up the, the chain, and, and theoretically, you're going to get to uh, uh, self-actualization at the peak. But the the big point he made is kids need a sense of belonging before they can realize their gifts. And when you segregate kids and say, you don't belong in that class, you have to earn your right to get into general ed, you really affect their motivation significantly. So that's why I'm such a rabid uh, advocate. And I'm pushing the system and have been for years because the mainland average is 66%. And there are some states that do as well as almost 100% of their kids with disabilities. So uh, I think Krista has done a fabulous job, but we have to push the rest of the state to recognize that this is such an important thing for kids' futures, you know, to belong to their environment, belong to their community. So that's my soapbox. Thank you. Thank you for in. You're like, you're connecting to things I'm going to chat about later. So that's awesome. Um, I think to everyone's point, right, keeping our expectations high is really important. Um, it is helpful when we go to schools and we share this information that this is where you're at, this is where our goal is. And then we do celebrate, like, to Susan's point, what we've done, not just me, but what all of us have done since 2017, but also bring back to the reality of we are still significantly below the national average, right? So we still wanna aim to uh, continue that growth and make sure all of our students have that basic human need met with that sense of belonging. 
All right. So I think we can move to the next slide. Yeah. So oh, 5B. Yeah, there we go. That's OK. We're excited. Um, so 5B is within um, the regular or Gen I class less than 40 percent of the day. And that this one we would like to be lowered. But you can see that there is um, a slight increase in that. So the baseline was in 2020, 16.3 percent. In 2021, we wanted it to be at 15.8 it went up to 16.2. I guess it decreased, but it still is below the target. Um, and then it went back up to 16.3% for 2022. Um, so again, I think we've kind of talked about some of the trends that have happened um, within those years and that period of time. Um, so thinking about this target, it does show like a 0.5% right, uh, decrease goal for that indicator. Um, thoughts on whether or not you think that's appropriate uh, seems to be we're not too far off from that target, but we have some work to do with this one as well. So any thoughts on this uh, target? Okay. We can move on to the next one, I think, Susan. All right, so the last indicator of those three parts is 5C. And again, that one's the separate schools, residential facilities, or homebound hospital placements. This one, again, we'd want that to um, decrease. But as you can see, we have had an increase over the last uh, few years. So the baseline was 0.96% of our students. We went up to one2 or 1.21% and then up to 1.34% of our students with separate schools, residential facilities, hospital homebound placements. Um, I can share my thoughts on maybe why that increased, but we've talked about some things that happened in that time span. So uh, what are your kind of thoughts, your folks' thoughts on what do you think happened between 21 and 22? Right, that time span of why students are being removed to either separate schools, residential facilities, or homebound and hospital placements. I have a thought. Well, I've, I've been in contact with um, someone at Kaiser who does ABA authorizations. And um, one of the pain points has been transitioning kids back to school because during the pandemic, they were getting full-time ABA services at home. And so then getting kids who were getting full-time ABA services back at home to come to school where the team is like, well, we've got to do an FBA, we've got to do this and that, we've, we've got to follow IDEA. There's been a lot of, or at least not a lot of, but I've heard a few different examples of the same problem happening in even different islands. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those insights, Josh, it's helpful. Anyone else? I will say too that I think as um, students started to return back to school um, from the pandemic, you know, it not just, it didn't just affect our students, it also affected our staff um, and our school system in general. And I think that um, what we've heard from a lot of teachers, a lot of school admin is that um, it was somewhat overwhelming. Um, because they were seeing students coming back to school with higher levels of behavior, higher levels of uh, more intensive needs, um, that at that point, they didn't feel like they were equipped to really uh, meaningfully address. So I wonder if some of the increase we saw over the past couple of years were also due to that and schools just kind of trying to get back to, you know, quote unquote, normal. Yeah, it makes complete sense to me. And that was, those were kind of my thoughts when I was looking at this data. Um, and in regards to target, right, we want it to decrease. Uh, they have it by 0.01%. Um, given what, you know, we experienced as a nation, but as a state um, recently, what are your thoughts on that target? Keeping that target, raising, lowering, Uh, Hawaii is much lower in this category than the mainland. This is our one shining 
area of LRE. So I'm not so uh, upset about lowering it a little bit. And I think the national average is at least 3% in this category. Now, I'll just say that we have about 10 minutes left just to get us motivated. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> so going once, going twice. Anyone want to share thoughts on the target? Okay. All right. So um, I, Susan touched on this, right? This is that statewide or nationwide data. So you can kind of see where um, Hawaii is compared to the rest of the nation in that sense. Um, so we, like we said, still have some work to do, um, but we can kind of talk about what we've done. So that's the next slide. So some of the things that we have done for this specific indicator, but like I said, um, we focus on all three, but really what we want to do is increase the percentage of our students in the gen ed setting for 80% or more of the school day, um, which does have an impact on the rest of the other two, B and C. Um, so what we have did, we started in 2017, 2018 with that partnership with Stetson and Associates. So to Heather's point, we brought them in. They worked really hard for 50 of our schools across the state, which um, they provided professional development for those 50 schools. They did some intense training and support um, in that time with those schools. But what we did in addition to that is we made Krista, sure that, yes. So sorry to interrupt you, but I think your mic moved and it's, you're really soft. Oh, can you hear me now? Much yes. better, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so Stetson worked with 50 schools and what we had them do in addition to that in the time that they were working with us is we made sure that they trained up the complex area and the state teams to be able to provide the same professional development they provided for those 50 schools across the whole state. So what we have is we have a professional learning network is what we call it of our inclusive practices leads for the complex areas where they um, meet with us and we talk about um, how we're going to sustain change on campuses, how we're going to look at data for individual campuses. So the two main data points we look at our LRE. And then also, as Heather mentioned, we look at those outcomes, right? So we also look at our achievement gap um, for the schools. So we have them look at that and kind of determine what level of support and also how and when they're gonna address the needs of the individual schools in their complex area. And we have them create those plans for the complex area. Um, and we do our best to support the complex teams. And we even go to schools and, and offer professional development at our level as well um, in regards to those things. We also make sure that we have opportunities, learning opportunities that are available statewide that are not just um, exclusive to our complex area team. So we did did have um, a statewide conference in 2021 where we allowed anyone to attend that conference and we provided them um, either stipends or reimbursements because we opened it up to EAs as well. Um, we have five demonstration sites across the state. We're looking to grow those five demonstration sites. We have two more schools uh, interested in coming on board and starting that process this year. Um, I think a big thing that we hear from schools is like, how does it look? How do we do it? So we wanted a site or a place where people can go to to see it in action and see it successful. So we have those five and we're looking to build that up. Um, we at the state office, we provide tier support um, to our complex area team. So we look at the complex area data in regards to the number of schools that they've supported with inclusive practices. We look at the complex area least restrictive environment data and we look at the complex area um, achievement gap. And what we do at the state office is we vary our level of support for those complex area teams based off where they fall in those different indicators. So some complex areas, maybe with a lower LRE or a higher gap, we would spend a little bit more time meeting with those individuals and helping them problem solve. Um, and then um, vice versa with the other ones, if they have a higher, higher um, LRE and maybe a little bit lower gap, they wouldn't have as much support as other ones. But we're always here 
here to help anyone that needs it. Uh, we continue the professional development. I think on the next slide, we talk about um, PDE3. Yeah, so we, we continue professional development both to the complex area teams. If we know that there's something that schools are really interested in learning more about, for example, accommodations versus modifications. Susan, to your point with your, with your kiddo, your grown man now, um, what we talk about is that inclusive practices and inclusion can be for um, a variety of students and their intellectual capacity should not affect them and their ability to participate within the gen ed setting. So getting teachers to understand that modifications are a way that we can possibly help some of our students with maybe more severe or profound needs to get them to still be able uh, to be a part of that gen ed setting. So that's one example of training and learning opportunities we would provide to the state or the complex level teams and then we can also provide it to the school level teams. So we have PDE3 courses that are for non-credit but we also developed PDE3 credited courses which again we're open to everyone in the whole state um, where teachers can take the courses for credit and learn more about accommodations and learn more about collaborative teaching is another one that we've done. Um, you see a number of other things here. We have a website with a bunch of different resources. We have recordings, we have parent training and parent resources on there. Um, and we also have that demonstration site information. So we have a number of things that we're trying to do um, to support our both our complex teams, but also straight to our school level. Um, but we have about four minutes. Um, so we want to open up to you folks to share anything um, that you think we can do in addition to what we've already done, uh, other strategies for improvement in regards to these indicator five, A, B, and C. Any thoughts? Well, my thought uh, is that Often the decision whether to to really put the effort into inclusion is voluntary, and you will have some really dedicated souls at a class, maybe a grade, that will do it. And then the next year the kid moves up and he can't find that same support. There really needs to be consistency. You can't give inclusion and then take it away. Uh, so there has to be a commitment from a complex area soup that we're going to take this all the way forward. Um, My general just chime in feedback too is that like it's great to have the PD for the teachers and stuff, but it's a school climate, like including students, you know, even when they need specialized interventions and supports, like having them, it's not just about what classroom they're in and what their IEP LRE is. It's really about how they're into how that students with disabilities are integrated into the whole school, how they're included across the day and in activities and are you in a separate PE class or are you in PE classes with your peers, you know, are you going into resources with your peers. Um, so I, I think that, you know, it's more than just the class and what's in the IEP LRE. It's really like you said, like Krista said, it's inclusive practices, right? It's not just LRE on the IEP. So I think that's, you know, just general. For sure. And I, we, we do have a needs assessment that we have campuses conduct and they look at all of those factors, even parents, right? Parent involvement, parent understanding on all of that. Um, but it, it goes back to Susan, your point um, with complex area superintendents, but also principals and all of that. So um, getting schools to see the importance of adopting this process in its entirety, where we look at all of those factors, um, Josh, to your point. So it is, those po components are on our radar. Um, we just, we gotta have, gotta have someone to back up that, that drive and that effort. Anyone else? Oh, you're muted, Susan. We got 60 seconds. Yes, I can, uh, we can point you toward the feedback form if you if you come up with an idea later. Yes. Uh, and thank you so much. This has been a really rich discussion and we appreciate you so much. Yes, thank you for your participation. Thank you. Thank Great you, everyone. everyone. Do we have the link to the feedback form? I oh. will. Uh, I will we can put it in the main chat when yeah. we go back to the um, main room. I'll Thanks, put it in Marlene. there. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.